Our study starts and our story begins in the book of beginnings, Genesis. Here in our first parents' glorious garden home, God had made them king and queen of the world. But he did not build for them a palace. He did not erect some fine stone house with marble floors and electric lights, even though he had given them silver and gold in abundance. Instead, he made for them a home amid the trees and flowers. For walls, this home had palm trees and fir trees and maple trees, and its floor was the soft, sweet-smelling earth gorgeously carpeted with bluebells and marigolds and primroses. For its roof, this home had the spreading branches of trees and up above that, the glorious dome of heaven, where the sun gave light by day and the moon and the stars gave light by night. There was no need for shelter. For in that far-off day when the world was born, there was neither rain nor storm. And so we are informed in Genesis chapter 2 verse 6, For there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. No bedroom, but cozy moss-covered nooks among the bushes and flower-strewn couches beside twinkling streams. No music room but birds chirping and trilling their harmonious songs amongst the trees. No kitchen, but bushes and fruit-laden vines ever loaded with wholesome and good things to eat. A sweet society, stainless, spotless, matchless, defectless, faultless, blameless and beyond compare. This world was immaculate, impeccable, indefectible, unblemished, unequaled, unmarred, untainted and untarnished. This was a utopia out of this world. But even more than a utopia, for this was not fantasy, this was reality. And so God had placed man in this pure, peaceful paradise named Eden. Eden in the Hebrew language meaning delight. It was in this garden of delight that God had commanded man in Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. There he says, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But, verse 17, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. <clears throat> For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In verse 18, God says it's not good for man to be alone. And so God, the surgeon, performs on Adam the patient the first ever surgery. This first surgery was a rib removal. In verse 21, God Almighty Lord of heaven and earth, source of life and sustainer of life, applies the divine anesthesia which sends Adam into a soothing, sedate and serene sleep. In verse 22, God takes Adam's rib and from it makes woman. In verse 23, Adam is now awake and we can read his reaction and response to God's latest creation. He says, read with me, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This was the name that Adam ascribed and assigned her woman. Everything in creation was now complete and altogether perfect. However, in chapter 3, as the woman stood there by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, listening to the soft spoken words of the serpent, 
the first doubt entered her mind. God had said, do not eat of this tree or you will surely die. Now the serpent says, you will not surely die. Who was telling the truth? Could it be that God was not telling the truth? Could it be that the serpent was telling the truth? We read in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 what happened. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Before he ate, a conversation between Adam and his wife must have taken place. Should he follow his wife in her path of sin and disobedience or give her up, trusting that God would somehow, in some way, restore his shattered happiness? The fact that she had not died and that no apparent harm had come to her did not deceive Adam. For 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 14 informs us, Adam was not deceived, but the woman. And so perhaps the woman's power of persuasion, coupled with his own love for her, induced him to share in the consequences of her fall. Instead of waiting until he should have the opportunity of discussing the whole tragic matter with God, Adam took fate into his own hands. Adam's fall was the more tragic of the two. For Adam did not doubt God, nor was he deceived like the woman. Adam acted in the certain expectation that what God had said concerning his disobedience, sin and the consequences of sin, would come true and come true it came patriarchs and prophets page 62 paints this picture as they witnessed in drooping flower and falling leaf the first signs of decay adam and his companion mourned more deeply than men now mourn over their dead the death of the frail, delicate flowers was indeed a cause of sorrow, but when the goodly trees cast off their leaves, the scene brought vividly to mind the stern fact that death is the portion of every living thing. We have grown so accustomed to suffering and dying and killing that in this world of death, it is hard for us to clearly comprehend and to truly understand the real meaning of life, eternal life and everlasting life. For our first parents, this was on the contrary, living in a world of life and a garden of delight. Death, even decay, seemed far away from the realms of possibility. But when that fruit was taken by woman, and eaten by the woman and, and given to Adam and eaten by Adam, sin entered the world. A society now of sorrow and suffering, of agony and affliction, of death and despair. This was the beginning of discord and disorder and discomfiture and discomposure and disconcertion and discomfort and distress and displeasure. I like how the clear word, the clear word paraphrases Genesis chapter 3 verses 16, 17 and 18. There God says, uh, turning to the woman, God said, because you have sinned, childbearing will be very painful for you. And because you desired to control your husband, you will be subject to him. Then God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife when you knew better and you ate fruit from the tree I told you not to eat from, you will live a life of toil. The soil will be hard to work and sorrow will follow you throughout your life. Verse 18, you will contend with thorns and thistles. 
allow me to update this verse. You, because of your sin and the consequences of your sin, will contend with the collapse of the economy, with the credit crunch and the financial crisis, meaning no job security, no housing surety, no insurance certainty. But because of your sin and the consequences of your sin, you will experience financial difficulties and physical disabilities and future uncertainties and academic inadequacies and spiritual insufficiencies. Because of your sin and the consequences of your sin, there will be a separation from me as your creator and you as my creature. You will need to experience revival and reformation. Because of your sin and the consequences of your sin, you will experience friends and family relatives dying. Typhoons and floods and monsoons. People being killed in the street, fighting in the home. And today we see the world full of evil and the consequences of sin. But I did not come this evening to preach a message of doom and gloom. There is hope. I said there's hope. I said there's hope. For the hope is found in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. Remembering that our subject for today is revival through his promise. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. Before God pronounces judgment uh, on Adam in verse 17. Before he pronounces judgment on the woman in verse 16. God pronounces judgment on Satan and with it gives a promise. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. 15. Let us look at the previous verse, verse 14. There it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Here's the promise, here's the hope now, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. As a result of this divine promise, the first ever promise that God made to man, Adam names his wife for the very first time in verse 20. Previously, he had called the woman, or his wife, woman. But because of this divine promise in verse 15, he named his wife in verse 20, Eve, meaning life. Eve, meaning mother of the living. Even though because of their disobedience, they would be affected and infected by sin. Even though because of their disobedience, they would experience the consequences of sin, ultimately death. Adam responded to the divine promise in verse 15 by naming his wife in verse 20, Eve, meaning life. Eve, meaning mother of the living. In verse 14 of Genesis 3, God turns from addressing the literal serpent which spoke to the woman to pronounce judgment on the old serpent, Satan. Verse 15 is the prophetic, uh, prophetic prediction of the coming deliverer, the seed of the woman who in 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 and Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 is he who came to destroy the works of the devil. And so I say again to you today, there is hope. The King James Version says, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. The word for bruise in Hebrew is shuf. Shuf. That Hebrew word shuf can be translated to mean in English to crush. To crush. 
What is the Hebrew word for bruise? Shuf. What is the Hebrew word for bruise? Shuf. Now, what can shuf be translated to mean? To crush. And so Adam and Eve look forward to the day when their seed, their child, their son would crush the head of the serpent, would crush Satan, put an end to sin, the consequences of sin and the penalty of sin. And so in my mind, I can see Adam in his mind remembering the words of God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 when he blessed them and said be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over everything and so Adam perhaps taking Eve by the hand uh, possibly putting his arm around her shoulder probably gazing lovingly into her eyes endeavoured to do what was divinely instituted only within the bounds of marriage to do. This physical act of intimacy between a husband and his wife was special and is special. But for our first parents, it was even more special because Adam and Eve were not only making love, but they believed that they were making the savior of the world, the seed of the woman who would stop Satan and put an end to sin and the consequences of sin. And so Genesis chapter four, verse one says, and Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. However, the Hebrew reads it literally something like this. I have gotten a man who is the Lord. As Eve held a beautiful baby in her arms, the firstborn of the first man and woman, she remembered the divine promise of God in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And so she named her son, Cain, meaning a man, the Lord, entertaining the hope that he was the seed, he was the Messiah, their savior, and the promised deliverer. But as Cain grew, Eve observed Cain. In worship, he was restless. In, during prayer time, he was fidgety. If Cain was with us this evening at midweek, he would be talking constantly throughout the service. He would be disturbing those in front of him, beside him and behind him. Perhaps Cain would be on his tablet trying to break his top score on Candy Crush. And so if Cain is beside you, give Cain a nudge and tell him or her to listen to the speaker this evening. Cain was not even interested in pathfinders, for a pathfinder needs to follow the instruction and direction of a master guide. But Cain did not care for authority, Cain wanted to find his own path. Eve had tried to teach Cain what was good and what was right and what was acceptable before God. But Cain wanted to do things his own way. What a disappointment Cain must have been. And so Genesis chapter 4 verse 2 says, And he bare again his brother Abel. Now Abel was not like Cain. Abel would have loved pathfinders. He would have loved to pray and participated in worship willingly and readily. Everything that his parents told him to do, Abel would do it with a humble and a contrite heart. He had learnt what was right. He had practiced them and they had become good habits. These good habits had produced an honorable behavior. This honorable behavior had formed a favorable character. This favorable character accompanied an acceptable attitude before God. Abel was accepted and respected by God. Abel must have pleased his parents. Incidentally, the name Abel means nothingness or vanity. 
The same vanity that depicts King Solomon's despair in Ecclesiastes describes Eve's disappointment in Cain. Cain wasn't the promised Messiah, but now there was Abel, now there was hope. And so the two brothers, having learnt from the same parents, offered a sacrifice to God. Abel, because of his good habits and his right behaviour and his good character and his right attitude, offered obediently with a humble and a contrite heart. Cain, he offered the way he wanted to. And God accepted Abel and his offering, but did not respect Cain with his offering. Verse 5 of Genesis 4 in the Hebrew reads something like this. It burned with Cain exceedingly. Cain felt fierce resentment against Abel and towards God. There was no sorrow for sin, no spirit of self-examination, no prayer for light, and no prayer for pardon. Cain's behavior is a typical example of a stubborn and unrepentant sinner whose heart does not melt under correction and reproof, but becomes even more hard and rebellious. No attempt was made by Cain to hide his feeling of disappointment, dissatisfaction and anger, but his resentment resulted in him murdering his brother Abel. Cain killed Abel. And so if my hermeneutic professors allow me a homiletic privilege, Cain. The representation of past pains and disappointments killed Abel, the hope of a future. What do you do when your past kills your future? Brothers and sisters of Ayers Church, what do you do when what has happened in your history hinders you from going on? That thing or those things which have caused you so much pain, so many headaches and hardships and heartaches. That thing or those things that you have had hope in, but because of which you have been disappointed. That thing or those things which have caused you to suffer so much in previous years that you don't think you can continue this year. What do you do when your past kills? your future. The irony for Eve was that her name meant mother of the living. But she has her second born son dead and the first born fleeing for the safety of his life. God had promised that the promised seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. But how do you go on when you have held on to the promises of God, but they're not being fulfilled in your life? And you tried the first time and you failed. And you tried the second time and you failed. And you try and you try and you try and you try until your hope is dead. You can imagine the misery Eve must have felt, her second-born son dead, her first-born fleeing for the safety of his life. Adam trying to comfort her, trying to encourage her that they must never, 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 never give up. And so seeing that her godly son was dead and that God's words concerning the promised deliverer could not find their fulfillment in cursed Cain, Eve still held on to the promise of God. For our key text for today, Genesis chapter 4 verse 25 says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Eve expressed her faith that the promised deliverer would come through Seth. Her faith was rewarded as the descendants of Seth obeyed the Lord. But this would not have been possible if it did not happen that Adam knew his wife again. From Adam and Eve came Seth, but no saviour. 
Enos, Kaina, then Mahalalil, but no Messiah. Jared, then Enoch, who walked with God, but he was not the promised seed. Methuselah, Lamech, then Noah, who endured a flood, but he was not the one who would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by whose stripes we are healed. Shem, Arphaxad, then Salah, but no saviour. Eber, Peleg, then Ru, but still no messiah. Serug, Nahor, then Terah, and the fulfilment of God's promise had not yet come, but hold on, Ayas Church, hold on. Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, the patriarchs, but still no deliverer. Judah, Perez, Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nashon, then Salmon, but nothing yet. Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Jesse, then the great King David. And I'm just wondering when will God fulfill his promise, but never, 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 never give up. Solomon. Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah, Jehoiakim, Sheitiel, Zerubbabel, Abiad, Eliakim, Azor, Zadok, Akim, Eliud, Eliezer, Mathan, Jacob, then Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Christ child, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, baptized in the River Jordan, the Lamb of God, that takes away your sin and my sin the promised seed of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 who came to bruise the head of the serpent to do away with sin and the consequences of sin for he died on Calvary rose the third day ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father as our high priest ever interceding on our behalf promise fulfilled the great I am who was there at the beginning is there at the end and will be with you whatever challenges or struggles you are facing even now. For he gives another promise in Hebrews 13 verse 5 and Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He was there uh, as the multitude of Hebrews passed through the Red Sea waters. He was there as the three friends of Daniel stood in the fiery furnace. He was there as the 12 disciples were tossed and turned about in their little fishing boat. As the wind beat hard against them and the waters rose round them. He was there. So no matter what trial you may have to pass through, like the multitude of Hebrews, no matter what trouble heats up around you, like the three Hebrew boys, no matter what tribulation that beats up and rises against you, never give up. Let us look for the final time at that divine promise, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember in the previous verse, verse 14, God had pronounced judgment on the literal serpent, formerly the most clever and beautiful of all creatures. The serpent was now deprived of wings and doomed to crawl in the dust. Now God turns from addressing the literal serpent in verse 14 to pronounce judgment on the symbolic serpent that old serpent Satan and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel your head processes the things you do it seems to be that if your head is crushed you are finished it is over but if your foot is crushed, you can still go on and do about your duties. You can still survive. Having your foot crushed, you can still survive. But your head crushed, it is completely over. And so even before the beginning, 
before the Garden of Eden in heaven, there was a great controversy between good and evil, between light and darkness, between truth and falsehood, between Christ and Satan. Satan deceived one third of the angels. He was kicked out of heaven. He entered the Garden of Eden. He deceived the woman. That old serpent since then has been slithering through the pages of sacred scripture, tripping up and tempting and deceiving God's people, trying to cause them to fall and to fail. But at the appointed time, God himself, came as man, a divinity wrapped up in humanity, for we are told a baby was born in Bethlehem. The old serpent Satan thought that he could crush Jesus, that promised seed. And so Jesus Christ died on the cross, crucified on Calvary. But no, that was only the crushing of the foot. For three days later, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, rose again. He bruised the head of the serpent, for he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so no matter what struggles and challenges that you may have, know that the head of the serpent, Satan, has been bruised. And so I get so excited, Dr. Ragui, when I watch National Geographic Channel or Discovery Channel or Animal Planet and there is a snake expert. A snake expert would advise you if ever you want to destroy a snake, you must strike it on the head. Interestingly, the poison is in the head. Jesus Christ has dealt with the venom of sin. He has dealt with the toxin. You may feel at times bitten, but know that that bite is not to death. And so Paul proclaims in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 to 57, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, great is thy faithfulness, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren in Ias Church, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so because of Jesus Christ and his victory, the victory which has already been won, and because of his faithfulness in fulfilling all his promises, you and I can have hope that no matter what challenges we have or what we're struggling with, we can march on ever onward, on ever forward, on ever upward, singing in our hearts this old Jamaican chorus that I learned as a child, press along, saints, press along in God's own way. Press along, saints, press along in God's own way. Persecution we must bear, trials and crosses in our way, but the hotter the battle, the sweeter the victory. And so there are two things that you need to remember no matter how long. Number one, hold on to the promises of God. And number two, never. Never, 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 never.